Welcome to this class on shield combat in which I'm going to guide you through a couple of solo exercises for fighting with various forms of shield. Uh, solo practice is a great supplement for your training in which you can focus on the individual details that make up any given technique and so that you can correct yourself, you can train it, rehearse it and condition your bodies to create kind of a toolbox which is at your disposal in fencing so that you don't have to think about these moves anymore but you do them almost instinctively. Now you have then replaced your instinctive moves with martially sound ones and this is what solo training is really really good for. We're going to look at fundamentals and the first thing that we are going to practice is footwork. Now footwork Good footwork is supposed to safely bring you from your starting position to your final destination. Now, as bridging distance also means time passing, this time is also at your opponent's disposal and naturally he will try to keep you from whatever you are about to do. That means that he will try to launch a specific counter and while this time is passing as you are closing in, you have to be flexible to be able to respond to any change of situation. You will not be able to do so if you commit to, say, striking a blow early on. So if, say, you are in the process of entering, then decide for a specific action and leap in to strike, then a long time passes in which you have no tactical flexibility when you cannot respond to any counter. Okay, so that means that you want to delay the decision, the commitment to concluding a technique until the very, very end so that when you finally do so, this time frame is so short that your opponent cannot do anything about it anymore. Okay, so any footwork that you use should provide you with the opportunity, with the chance to stay, to remain in control and have this flexibility to respond to any change of situation until you finally decide to strike, thrust or whatever you want to do or whatever is required in that situation to win you the fight. Okay, so I hope you're probably warmed up as we're going to look at posture first. Adopt the shoulder wide stance. Stand straight by bringing forward your hip. Engage the core muscles in your abdomen to keep the hip in place and relax your buttocks. Straighten your back. Relax the shoulders. Do not pump up the chest, so don't bring the chest forward. Instead, straighten your neck. Now place the feet about a step's length apart from each other. Make sure that feet are pointing outwards at about a 45 degrees angle. Lower yourself by making a motion as if sitting down onto a stool. This will result in folding the body in the hip. Lift your arms and lift hands to about shoulder height or maybe face height. Make sure that the arms are extended and that the, the elbows are not sticking out to the side. Your hip and your torso are square on. Do not move the hip so that one side is pointing forwards. Instead, keep the hip locked. Of course, this could either be a right leg forward stance or a left leg forward stance. This kind of posture and the respective footwork is informed by historical sources. You can see it in the Fechtbücher, but also in high medieval miniatures and even in early medieval sources such as the Utrecht Psalter. So it bears testament to a particular European culture of motion that is used in physical activities such as dancing and combat. So next we're going to prepare to enter, to get closer to our opponent without giving away that we are about to do so. 
So we are cutting down our opponent's reaction time, who usually is focused on the overall frame of his adversary, namely us, and we are simply just extending the front leg and placing the heel in a new position. See that the body is not moving at all. So do this, extend the leg, place the heel on the ground and pull it back again to original position. Yeah, so your body, your torso, your head, your shoulders, all this should remain static, stationary, and it's just the leg that is moving. The weight is on the back leg here, or else the front leg couldn't move freely. In this exercise, we are pretending that we are already in range to make contact with the opposing weapons in order to gain control. However, we are not yet in hitting range. Now, the idea here is that first you gain control, being on the safe side, because you're not yet in hitting range. This also implies that in order to get so close that you can use your advantage and land the hit, you need to bridge even more distance. And this step here is preparing this final move. So if something goes wrong in between, you can still recover and you have not yet committed to the actual step. So let's move on and do this final step. So we are assuming that we have entered, we have gained control, we have prepared our step, and as we have done so, we realize it's safe to bridge the last bit of distance and land the hit and conclude our technique. In order to do so, we roll the foot over the heel, adopting a new position with the front foot, and shift the weight forward towards the target. Finally, we conclude the whole action by recovering the rear foot, collecting the rear foot, and we are back in our original posture. The situation can change as you cover final distance, regardless of whether there is a crossing of blades or any weapon contact or not. So stick to this very careful and cautious approach, even if your opponent is not doing anything. Starting from a position where we are already in weapon range is all fine. However, how did we get there in the first place? So start from an upright position. And now with a passing step, you are going to reach fencing distance. So as you take this step, lower yourself, raise your arms and adopt exactly the position that we have practiced before. And then proceed as we have trained earlier. The great advantage of the kind of distance management that is advocated in this workshop is that you can gain control over the fight at a range at which your opponent cannot hit you. So this makes for an extremely safe approach to combat. Only when you have gained complete control, you move in to land a hit. Now it's time to bring in the weapons. We're first going to start with the earliest form of shield that's going to be covered in this little tutorial and that's going to be the Viking round shield or the Germanic round shield. If you don't have a Viking shield at hand, you can just as well use a stick or use a scabbard. Maybe it's a good idea to use a stick first anyway because it's going to tire out your shoulder and you want to get the mechanics right before you learn to cope with the weight of your shield. Okay, so the one thing that's important about all forms of shield, particularly those that are center grip, is that you grip them pretty much exactly as you grip a weapon anyway, like for instance your sword. So this is the kind of grip that you want to adopt and that I use most of the time. 
Okay now, so what we're going to do next, we are going to use this shield to cover ourselves as we are entering. So we are probably going to make contact as soon as we are in weapon range with the opposing shield. We are sensing the pressure that we receive through the shield which uh, informs us about the opponent's next move and we are pretending that we are stronger here so we are levering open his shield just a little bit in order to be to get a, uh, a line for an attack. When you do this with a viking shield make sure that the shield is correctly angled as you close in. The lower edge of the shield must not be too far away from your body because then this will create an opening for an Unterhau, for a back edge strike that can attack your hand. And of course you should not go to the other extreme either. That means if the lower edge is too close to your body then your head is no longer safely protected by this nice roof which is your shield. Of course you can do the same exercise with your 14th century heater shield that is a very light type of uh, heater shaped shield and there are various ways that you can hold such shields. They have very versatile strapping systems and they come in a variety of strap arrangements. Now for our purposes the elongated grip that we have just applied to our stick or our viking shield serves our purpose best for this particular exercise in which we are going to use the shield actively, offensively. So I'm using exactly the same grip as you can see as the thumb is slipped through one of the straps and the other fingers are holding the remaining strap and then I'm aiming with that corner over there. This is later on also going to protect my sword hand. Mind you that kite-shaped shields appear to have been used somewhat differently, more like mobile armor. So don't actually try this with a large kite shield, that wouldn't be appropriate to that form of shield. And now for the blow. In many situations in shield combat, the right Tverhau is a great solution. It's a blow that is most appropriate to circumvent the opposing shield, which is the obstacle right in front of you. The Tverhau opens up new attack lines behind the shield. It can be launched from your right shoulder and strikes from your left. That makes it a sophisticated and rather intricate blow and there are a number of details to pay attention to. What is so cool about the sword is that the sword is a labor-saving device. So you should not try to put a lot of body power into your blow, but rather work with the sword and let it move according to its physics. It is supposed to turn around its pivot points. There are plenty of videos about pivot points if you've never heard about them. And these are the points that the sword wants to naturally turn around and don't try to force it turn around any other spots. This will make for weak blows and will come with all kinds of disadvantages. So in order to strike a really a nice and powerful sword blow, you should think about using say a riding whip or something like that. Cracking a whip that has the same kind of explosiveness that you should try to implement with your sword blows. And the same is true for our Tverhau here. It's a really powerful blow and uh, it's best if it feels totally effortless. Now to get to that stage you have to train a lot, but I'm going to show you how I do it. And note that in accordance with the body mechanics and the stepping that we were training earlier, my body, my shoulders are not moving at all. 
So I'm striking this blow and it's only the sword that does the job. You're going to negatively change pivot points if your shoulder moves. You are going to lose all the energy of that whip cracking explosiveness that you are trying to achieve. When I strike this blow, I also move my hip. Actually, it's more like a contraction because you don't see much hip movement from the outside. Instead of moving the sword side hip, I move the shield side hip forward. So there is a kind of a counter motion and that uh, locks my torso, but also gives extra acceleration to the sword. Instead of turning the whole blade so that the thumb is on the bottom side as I strike, I just place the thumb on the opposing side. So because my sword is held and controlled um, by the ring finger and the little finger, the pinky, as I start my initial motion, this kind of thrusting motion to the side, I can safely remove the thumb from its original position and place it on the opposing side so that as I strike, the thumb is on the bottom side. So this is an alternative way of striking your Tverhau. At any rate, when striking a Tverhau with an axe, you have to do the thumb shift or else you would have to rotate the complete shaft of the weapon and that would result in striking with the back of the axe head instead of its edge. So finally we combine all these elements. It's a fundamental move, a fundamental motion, and remember that you pay attention to each single step. So you don't want to weld it into one unchangeable and fixed entity. You should be conscious of each and every stage because the whole point of these exercises is that you pay attention to the order of events which will guarantee that you have the flexibility to respond to a change of situation in fencing. 133 aficionados will have already noticed that the exercises that we have been practicing nicely tie in with 133's Schützen or cover versus second wall. And it is very likely that medieval butler systems of the 13th and 14th century were informed by contemporary military shields. Of course, when you are using a buckler, it will be the blades, the swords that make contact first and you have to position your sword in such a fashion that it forms a barrier against any incoming attack. The posture which we have trained is also great for using a spear in conjunction with your shield. Because the torso is not moving, you can keep the shield in position to cover you as you shoot forward your spear. We have already learned that if we bring forward the opposing hip, namely the shield hip, we can lock the torso but also help accelerate our weapon. Slide thrusts are seen quite often in period art. However, oftentimes it's quite confusing to see both the starting position of the hand and the end position of the weapon in one and the same illustration. Slide thrusts generate a lot of power and because our torso remains stationary, we do not overcommit and we do not expose ourselves as we shoot forward the spear. First, we train to lift the spear into the overarm position and then lower it again into the underarm position. Try to keep the spearhead in one position all the time. So the shaft is actually moving around the spearhead as you lift your hand. Fine motor skills are quite challenging here. So coming from an underarm position, clamping the shaft with your thumb and your index, as you lift the spear, position the other fingers below the spear shaft. Now, as you move your thumb back, let the spear shaft drop onto your palm 
and index finger and thumb are pointing backwards now. To go back, extend the index finger so that the spear is clamped between your middle finger and your index finger. Reposition the thumb so it's underneath the shaft and as you lower it, fold the middle finger, the ring finger and the pinky over the spear half to go back to underarm position. I hope you found this workshop helpful for your training. Thank you very much for your attention and hope to see you from behind a shield at one point.